Now I would like to introduce our next speaker for EXL 2022, Mr. Mark McKenzie from Kubuto. We are so glad that he is here with us to share his insights about the future of digital asset management in higher education. Mark is an accomplished leader with more than 30 years of experience in the technology sector. His career has spanned the globe and included leadership roles at small startup ventures and larger public companies alike. More recently, Mark has advised investment firms on go-to-market strategies and best practices. Mark's proven leadership, industry knowledge, and track record of success make him the ideal executive to lead Kuvuto in the future. As a reminder to all our attendees, this conference is being recorded. We will have Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please use the Q&A tool if you have a question for the speaker. Over to you, Mark. You can now share your content and unmute yourself. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for that uh, absolutely wonderful and far too kind uh, introduction. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, so, uh, I'm Mark McKenzie. I'm the CEO of Cavuto, and the topic that I want to talk about today uh, is the future of digital asset management in higher education. Um, and I really want to lock it into the theme of the conference. So, conference theme is experiential learning: the the future of workforce development. So my question is, what should the learning experience become to support that future? How should today's schools evolve to become the future schools, which can do the best job at preparing tomorrow's students for what the workplace in the future will look like? And how could I possibly answer those questions today without really addressing the role of edtech? Um, and digitally enabled education in that future, because I think it's going to be very much a central theme. Uh, and certainly uh, the lockdown that we just, just went through has really accelerated that. So my goal in just 30 short minutes, which is very difficult, I could really talk about this, this topic for, for days, honestly. Um, we only have 30 minutes, is to lay out just one hypothesis uh, of how I think today's schools will evolve to become those future schools. Uh, specifically, I'm, I'm going to offer you a vision uh, for how a big component as part of that digital asset, digital resource management and distribution um, must itself evolve to ensure that schools can provide a quality education experience for, for all future students. So when we think about digital education in general, um, there are certainly multiple categories that EdTech falls into, and I'll show you a chart in a second that, that kind of shows you what I, I think at least one view of that landscape looks like. Um, but for the core learning experience, there are really two primary categories that we care about. There's technology which supports the, the core delivery of the curriculum, and we all know those solutions, right? LMS solutions. Um, and then there's the technology which supports access to the digital resources, the digital content that's required uh, as mandatory support for that curriculum. So this is an eye chart, and I apologize for that. And actually, it's just one view of the EdTech landscape. It, it happens to be coming from uh, AGC. It's their view of the EdTech landscape. And I'm sure there are many other EdTech companies we could put onto this chart. Um, in recent years, there's really been an explosion of ed tech um, and digital resource content uh, of all types to support digital learning. As I said, the lockdown really uh, and the requirement for schools to, to fund and governments supported this certainly over the last few years to provide digitally enabled distance learning has really accelerated this explosion of ed tech solutions and, and digital content providers. So my question to you is, when you look at this chart, do you see hope or do you see horror? Um, and I guess the answer is it depends on your role um, and how you fit into the educational ecosystem. Um, but the reality is it's probably a bit of both. So we can't deny that the innovation in education is a good thing. But certainly the innovation and the pace of innovation can't be to such a point where it becomes overwhelming, it becomes exhausting for the schools. Um, and the learning experience essentially becomes less about learning, 
are more about learning to use all the tools and systems and content that's out there to support the educational experience. As far as digital resource content goes, at Cavuto, you know, we recognize that there's an ever expanding list of digital, digital resource types and the number of those in each of the categories. So for example, academic software estate. Today we acknowledge there are over 900 commonly used software titles uh, in, in academia, in higher ed especially. Um, there's over 100,000 digital textbooks now that have been turned digital um, and are available in digital format. Millions of OER resources, digital OER resources, which are you know, funded um, content that's freely available for, for students to use out there in the world. Um, there's a proliferation of different digital learning platforms as the stakeholders that are involved in traditional education of being faced with this digital revolution. Everyone's developing their own digital learning platform. The problem is, what does that mean for a school? Of course, there's school produced digital materials, and then there's video and then there's podcasts and the list goes on and on and on. So the question remains, is this hope or is this horror for schools? So what I'm going to talk about today is. You know, how does a school address that, right? How should a school manage this proliferation of ed tech and digital content so they can evolve into a future school capable of preparing students to succeed in the workplace of the future. I'm going to talk about the current state of digital asset management in higher ed, um, move on to the current best practice, the best solutions we have out there for addressing the current state, and then give you that vision of how I think uh, the future will evolve um, for this space. So let's start with the current state of digital asset management um, in education. So what are the current norms? And the, let's think about how the proliferation of ed tech and digital content sources have really exasperated this situation, and especially in the last couple of years for the IT teams, the Office of Software Licensing, and then for the student staff and faculty. Um, certainly the lockdown made the situation worse, and it's really illustrated the fact that many of these groups within schools are simply not ready. So for IT, IT and the Office of Software Licensing, all these different platforms and procedures, um, which do you choose? Which do you pick? How do you integrate them? How do you plug them into your current school system? Much of the software still today is distributed in many different forms. There's physical media, there's uh, perpetual license downloads, there's cloud access. The, the groups, the IT groups and the office software with license groups, many of the things they do to manage access to all of that software content uh, is manual and consumes a lot of headcount. Um, they have limited visibility. They have to use spreadsheet, spreadsheet tools or they have to repurpose their ITSM solution or find some kind of way to build a manual um, homegrown system to, to manage all the complexity. And with that, there's then no way to ensure compliance. All right, all, all of these software products all of this digital content typically comes with licensing that has terms you have to comply with and then there's data security issues pii compliance issues how do i deal with all of those and all of this costs money right we have to in many cases we're trying to buy an enterprise license for the school um, or we're trying to figure out if we paid money up front how do we recover costs there's no easy way to implement cost allocation or uh, for an enterprise license or to get the students to participate in some form of cost recovery. How do you implement that with a homegrown system? Or if you're using a spreadsheet to manage uh, the distribution of the digital content. So for staff, uh, students and faculty. How do you deal with all these different platforms and procedures for, for obtaining all the different software you need, all the different ebooks um, and other digital resources for your course? I've literally seen solutions with schools to present web pages to students that have a whole series of links and every link leads to a different solution, a different system, a different reader that the student has to learn in order to be able to consume the con content that's being mandated as part of their curriculum. It's an absolute nightmare for the students. They have confusion over where to go and how to get all the books they need in a timely fashion. And it's been proven statistically, data shows 
that when a student gets access to content in a timely fashion in their curriculum, their scores improve. And when they don't, they decline. There's no real direct linkage between uh, curriculum content. So if I'm in the LMS and I'm studying away, how do I directly link the moment of need, of content need, to the curriculum and the education journey that's happening? How do I do that? Um, if I have lots and lots of different systems, lots and lots of islands of automation, in order to be able to facilitate that linkage. I have li very limited ability, unless I have business rules built in around things like inclusive access or equitable access or tech fees. How do I implement and enforce eligibility and entitlements so that students get what they're entitled to? And if I can't do that, does a student just go out and buy it on the open market, in which case they're then spending more money than they necessarily need to in an already expensive uh, educational journey? So here's a picture of kind of what this looks like. I mean, essentially what we have is a many to many problem, right? There are many ISVs, there are many software vendors providing academic, academic software into schools. There are many book publishers, each of them, many of them have their own platforms all providing that content uh, into schools. The academic institution itself has central centralized groups and tries to provide some of that centralized content, but each of the departments then goes away and does its own thing and licenses its own thing. So on one side, you have many vendors producing content with many different systems and many different platforms. Then you have many schools and within the schools, you have many departments all doing their own thing. Everybody trying to figure out how to connect with each other, often repetitively. We have this many to many problem and it's essentially a mess. There are many forms of digital content. There are many vendors. There are many schools and each have their own unique technical environment. Um, and then, of course, you have the students bringing their own device to school as well. So how do we solve this? How do we solve this problem? Well, the current best practice and the good news is there is some hope out there. Um, there are vendors and, of course, Cavuto is one of them uh, that look to bring order to that many to many chaos. So the current best practice is really to just do the simple task of taking many software vendors, bring them into one place and then distribute the content out uh, to the many schools. So we take the many to many and we make it a many to one to many. Um, even with that model though, there are still many challenges with the approach. And much of that tends to be rooted in how humans adopt innovation. Um, we have a tendency uh, to be ontologically entrenched in the ways in which we do things. So if I look at this model in front of you now, what you see is you see software vendors. Software vendors, the way they interact with educational institutions is they're typically doing some sort of uh, enterprise license agreement or campus agreement, and they're a software company, so they act like a software company. The school has to treat them as a software company. The publishers, very different beast. Right, a book publisher is very different than a software company. Book publishers themselves are typically made up of fiefdoms that kind of map the geologic ge geographic lines. Um, and each of those geographies will tend to act a little bit uniquely in, in how they want to interact with schools in their geography. And so there are agreements between publishers and schools, and that's a book publisher type agreement. And there's specific agreements around how you consume digital assets. Um, we have to ingest their content. So how we ingest the content is different from software vendors to book publishers. And then we have other asset types like OER resources and resource codes and learning platforms. Each of those we have to figure out a handle in this centralized system. So the way it works typically today is we have to handhold the vendors. We have to handhold the book publishers. We have to bring them in to the system and help them come in and treat them uniquely and individually. The schools themselves still think in traditional terms. So they still think about IT. They still think about a library. They still think about a bookstore. But let me ask you this question. If I have a digital textbook, does the concept of a library and a bookstore even make sense anymore? Because if the only distinction between a, a library and a bookstore is the borrowing versus purchasing mechanism of that book, of that physical book. Once I have a digital book and I have unlimited, by definition, I have unlimited quantities, 
surely the only distinction is the length of time that I'm keeping the digital book for. I'm subscribing to the digital book. I can subscribe for a day, a week, a month, or forever, in which case it's a perpetual license to that book. What I would propose to you today is actually the concept of a library and a concept of a bookstore are actually dead man walking. They make no sense in schools today because we already have the digital textbook. So what are schools going to do with these lovely library buildings and these lovely bookstore buildings? And this is a problem that is in human nature. So we tend to, to hold on to concepts. So think about, I'll give you an example from Victorian England. Um, back in the Industrial Revolution, there was a million working horses in Victorian England. Those working horses worked the roads and the canals and pulled trans, uh, goods around um, industrial England in a massive scale. And then the in internal combustion engine was invented. And suddenly there was a possibility of replacing horses with uh, fuel engines, petrol driven engines. Interestingly, that innovation was considered an anti-pollution mechanism, which is kind of ironic if you think about the world today. But because the horses would obviously mess up and foul in the streets and in the canals, the introduction of the in, in, in internal combustion engine was seen, seen as an anti-pollution mechanism. So basically the, the automobiles replaced the horses, but of course we call the power associated with a car horsepower. And that's because humans are ontologically entrenched. We still think in the old way, even when we have an innovation in front of us. And often when the innovation is there and it'll solve the problem, it takes us a while to adopt that innovation. So today's best practice with digital resource management and distribution is good, um, but it's still rooted in these historical concepts. We're still treating software vendors uniquely and book publishers uniquely, and we still think about terms of a digital library and a digital bookstore and my academic software estate uh, that I have. So we offer up islands of automation, and that makes it more difficult to manage and control uh, the digital education journey. If you think about academic software as an example, to give you one more example, academic software today, most of it could be cloud-based, but the vast majority of those 900 software titles are still delivered as perpetual licenses in download form, and that creates a headache that we have to manage. So what we have today in the world is good, but how does it get better? How can it look better in the future? How can this evolve into an even better platform that can really resolve that many-to-many -many challenge into a very efficient, effective, and streamlined many-to-one-to-many -to -many, uh, platform? So what needs to change to get to a better future um, is we need to define what a best practice in digital resource management and distribution. We need to, we, we need to find what a definitive edge enablement layer between digital asset creators and education consumers and managers should look like. And I, want, I do want to point out, even when we define this, right, this future that I'm describing here, it's not like I can click my fingers, even though much of the technology exists today, it's not like I can click my fling fingers and it's just going to happen overnight. It's going to take time, right? What will happen is this hypothesis, this vision I'm presenting to you right now, I think it will be come an option to start with, a, a, a viable option that ultimately over time will be adopted more and then eventually it will become the new standard. And that's my hypothesis. So I think the path forward here is clear. What we need and the path that um, digital asset management and education needs to take is actually a well-trodden path. That path has already been taken by the music industry. It's already been taken by the movie industry and the uh, TV content industry. So if we think about how those spaces evolved, we've always had digital content producers on one side and then consumers of that content on the other. What has essentially happened in both those spaces, in all three of those spaces, I should say, is that essentially they've munged together and on one side, you have packaged digital content providers that provide a service that plug into a centralized platform that the consumers on the other side, it's very easy to understand what you get to sub subscribe to, 
and then you can subscribe to it and consume that content on an ongoing basis. So we need exactly the same thing in academia. So on one side, on the left side here, on the vendor side, I can have any vendor. It doesn't matter if it's a software vendor, a book publisher. Um, it could be you. It be, could be you producing some content that you want to push into the academic system to be consumed in the digital enabled academic curriculum. What the system, the platform should do is enable you to self serve service onboard yourself, set up your business rules for how your content can be consumed, the licensing models. It should facilitate in real time the establishment of the agreement between you and the educational institution. It should enable you to manage the financials associated with the content that's being consumed. It should pay you on time. Um, you should pay the appropriate uh, subscription for you to be par participating in the model. It should provide you great data insights into how your content's being consumed, how you can improve it over time, and then offer you marketing services so you can promote your content. The vendor types, it could be software vendors, book publishers, authors, podcast producers, video producers, professors, adjuncts, resellers, anyone who has content that wants to push it into the ecosystem. It should be really easy to ingest, set yourself up, and get ready to go. The asset types could be software, ebooks, OERs, resource codes, SaaS software, videos, podcasts, learning materials. On the school side, it could be a traditional school, but it could be a modern school, a future school. It could be a self learning platform, it could be a massive online open community. They need to be able to, again, with no stress, self serve or onboard themselves to this platform. They need to be able to set themselves up as an organization. They need to be able to authenticate themselves into the platform and understand what authentication means for authorized individuals and what entitlements those individuals have to consume the content that the school is signing up for. They then can pick and choose. They can curate the content they need for their curriculum. They can pick and choose the, the vendor types and what content and what packages those vendor, vendors have offered having published themselves into the platform. Again, as they sign up for the content, the agreements get instantiated in real time and the system, the platform is managing those agreements in real time. And then financial management should take place. So as I consume content, I understand what I have to pay for the content that's being consumed as part of the academic journey that I'm providing. I should, the system should be able to allow me to set up my billing codes, do cost allocation across my educational organization, provide if I want to turn on cost recovery so my students can participate in paying for the cost of the content. And again, give me all the data insights and analytics so I understand how to improve my educational journey, what content's being used, not used, what I need more of. All of that should be available to me. So this is how the system should work. It should be the definitive enablement layer between digital asset creators on one side education consumers and managers on the other side. It should be free flow, it should be easy. And we shouldn't, none of, none of the entities on either side should be worried about that proliferation of all those islands of automation and technology. All of those should plug and play into this platform. At Cavuto, this we call this the Kuroku vision because we kind of think of ourselves, what we're evolving to is some sort of model, kind of like a Roku system in, that you, that, that's used in the, in the US for movies, TV access. For those of you in the US, for those not in the US, I apologize, but look up Roku and kind of help you understand what I'm talking about. So Cavuto is certainly working hard to make this vision that I'm presenting here to you today a reality. We're trying to bring some of that chaos into order by evolving into a platform like this. And this would give, we believe, fundamentally give schools the chance to become those future schools allow them to provide a quality educational experience that will, you know, learning experience that will prepare those students for the digital workplace of the future. So with that, um, I'll wrap up and open it up for, conversa for conversation and questions.